Okay, so our seminar speaker for today, the one that was originally scheduled, was sick today, so um, she cannot make it. So um, this is not um, Jane Marie Law. Um, this is um, Professor Natalie Mahold, and Natalie is a professor in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences here at, at Cornell, and she's graciously um, accepted to give a seminar at the last at the last minute. Um, so Natalie um, um, graduated in a, with a degree in physics and German from Washington University. She went on to get a degree in natural resource pol policy at Michigan University, and then a um, PhD in meteorology at MIT. She's worked both in um, Santa Barbara at the university and at the Na National Center for Atmospheric Research before she came here to Cornell. So um, her research specializes on um, um, looking at feedbacks in the Earth's system that impact climate change, in particular biogeochemical feedbacks, um, such as dust, which both affect nutrient loading and the atmospheric balance of, of radiation. And she does her research both using climate models and using data, both satellite data and data sensed in situ on ground sites. Um, particular also, Natalie was a lead author on the IPCC 1.5 degree report, which was a report on how we can, on the possibilities to keeping climate warming below 1.5 degree. And she was the lead author on the fifth IPCC climate assessment report. So um, just um, welcome Natalie and thank her for coming in at the last minute. Well, thank you very much um, for having me here at the last minute. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to reach the low carbon targets, as well as what it's like to be on um, an IPCC report. Um, just uh, a little bit about myself, right? I'm um, an atmospheric scientist. That's how I was trained. But really what I do now is think about the world as an Earth system science. I think about how the land impacts the atmosphere, impacts the ocean. Um, I work with uh, what's called the big climate models, the premier um, Earth system models, we call them now. Um, so full complexity models. And um, I'm not really here to talk about my research. I'm going to talk about being on the IPCC and, and what that tells us about how to reach the low carbon targets and low climate targets. Of course, hopefully you all know that this course is the only requirement for the climate change minor, but I want you to think about all the great classes. Um, that you can take in climate change on this campus here. Um, both Peter and I are some of the coordinators of that minor. All right, I just want to start out, and um, you guys are hopefully connoisseurs of climate change, but I'm going to remind you of a few things about climate change. Uh, reminder number one, higher temperatures, more damage. We're just drifting farther and farther away from pre-industrial, but humans are used to, what ecosystems are used to, it's worse the um, higher the damage is. So I'm just going to illustrate here. I guess you guys are pretty good with your RCPs and SSPs now. You got them all memorized? Okay, maybe not. Um, but you've heard of them. You know what I'm talking about if I reference those. So over here, what we have is global mean temperature change. Um, so this is relative to 1986 to 2005. Here is relative to pre-industrial on the right-hand side. This is our temperature records, so from observations. And then here we have kind of what's called like the business as usual. It's a little bit of a high fossil fuel use scenario, although I would argue it's actually a low land use scenario, like just like all the, um, the RCPs and SSPs are. So that gets us to five degrees. It's got a good chance of staying below five degrees at 2100, okay? And after that, it goes high. So it's, it's a really high scenario. Then um, this right here is the RCP 2.6, or um, it's a low emission mitigation scenario. Um, and uh, uh, the way that this was presented in the fifth assessment was these reasons for concern diagrams, just talking about how the higher the temperature goes, the more unique and threatened ecosystems that get impacted, extreme weather events, you know, all these different impacts, global aggregated impacts, right? The higher the temperature, the worse the impacts are. What, what are unique and threatened ecosystems? What do I mean by that? Who's going to feel it the first? Uh, 
with Global South in terms of people, let's talk about ecosystems here. Which ecosystems are going to be feeling it the worst? Yeah. Is it aquatic? Uh, aquatic specific aquatic systems. Corals. Corals are going to feel it the worst. Or what other ecosystems? Think about the image of the, the climate change we often have is like a polar bear on a little frozen piece of ice, right? Polar ecosystems also are going to cease to exist. So that's what we mean here, okay? Higher temperatures, the worst damage. Reminder number two. Our goal is to stabilize greenhouse gases concentrations in order to stabilize the climate at as low of a change as possible. Okay. So, um, right, if we want to move from this business as usual, high, high uh, fossil fuel use, down to um, this case here, which has a 66% chance of staying below two degrees, what happens here. Um, it is actually that we have a radical restructuring of the economy. So the very first scenario that did this, um, <laughs> everyone was vegan, <laughs> okay? And it used a huge amount of bioenergy, um, carbon capture sequestration. This is a huge um, restructuring of the economy here, all right? And um, it, we have to do this. So we see the, the urgency now in order to change the scenarios later, right? And that's because the CO2 has such a long time scale in, in the atmosphere, right? Climate change occurs as long as there are any anthropogenic CO2 emissions, net positive, okay? Because CO2 has such a long time scale in the atmosphere. Um, what um, this is again from the AR5, um, AR5 is the assessment report number five, the round. And there's a linear relationship between the temperature anomaly relative to pre-industrial and the cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions, right? Not the you know, today's emissions, it, it's cumulative over the whole time period. And um, so we have to get the emissions to zero as soon as possible in order to reach the lowest targets. Um, so why zero anthropogenic CO2 emissions, right? Because 25% of the anthropogenic CO2 we emit today will be in the atmosphere in 10,000 years, okay? There are some quick feedbacks where the CO2 goes into the land and the ocean on short time scales right now. But what we think will happen is 25% is gonna be there in um, 10,000 years, okay? So this means that all our emissions of anthropogenic CO2 basically accumulate in the atmosphere on these time scales. All right. Reminder number four, 25 to 50% of CO2 emissions, depends how you count it, are hard to cut. It is amazing that we have wind and solar right now because that's the only reason we can get off that five degree um, time scale or trajectory and get down to three degrees. It's probably what we'll hit if we're really aggressive about switching to wind and solar. But, but the power sector is the easy part. Okay, now it's the most important part and we have solutions for most of it right now, but we still don't have solutions for some of the um, ways that we emit CO2 right now. For example, um, variable electricity, intermittency problems, right? That, you, you know, you don't have any solar energy when the sun's not up and you don't have any wind energy when the wind's not blowing. Um, aviation, shipping, cement and iron and steel. Okay, and remember that all those wind turbines and solar uh, infrastructure is going to require a lot of iron and steel, right? So this doesn't even count the 25% coming off of, uh, or 40%, it depends how you do the math there, coming off of uh, agriculture and, and, and land uh, conversion, okay? We have a big, big problem in terms of trying to reach the low climate targets. Now, reminder number five, I find that people aren't really aware of the fact that we're actually really successful. We humans right now are really successful at bringing people out of poverty. Uh, the, before COVID, I don't know what COVID is doing to this, but it, it's just amazing that we're the, the millennial development goals. I don't know if you guys heard about these, but the, China in 2000, they had these goals to reduce poverty and end hunger by a certain percentage, and they achieved it. They, they, everybody was incredulous. So then they set up the sustainable development goals. And the idea is by 2030, no hunger, no poverty, 
uh, all sorts of amazing goals. Now, maybe we won't reach those goals, but it is incredible how many people are being pulled out of extreme poverty on the planet today. We're not done. I'm not saying we're done. I'm just saying that it's incredible how much progress we've made. So here, for example, is a, a plot, um, 1820 to 2015, um, 1 billion to 7 billion. And so the red and the green together is the total number of people on the planet. So we've radically increased it. But the green is the number of people not in extreme poverty. And the extreme poverty is extreme here, for sure. This is, uh, I think it's like $2 a day or something like that. But for the first time ever in the history of humans, we actually decreased the number of people living in extreme poverty. This is, this is amazing. Like, we're not done, but this is amazing. But how did we do it? Okay, how did we do it? How did we get to our development level here? We did it by emitting a lot of CO2, okay? And the people in developing countries, the people living in extreme poverty, the people living in poverty, they want to have our lifestyle. They want to be living like us. They want to not have their children die of preventable diseases, right? They want the same things we have. And if they follow our development pathway, that we're going to emit a lot of CO2. They're going to emit a lot of CO2. The future emissions are dominated in that, in that 8.5 or any of the future scenarios. The emissions are dominated by emissions from developing countries. I mean, it just makes sense. There's more people in those countries. There's like a billion people in the developed countries and 6 billion people in the developing countries. They follow our development pathway. They will emit huge amounts of CO2. Okay, um, are, are we in the position to tell them they can't develop, that they can't have what we have, that their children have to die of preventable diseases because it, they should, can't emit CO2? I mean, that's a, that's a really, really huge dilemma. So for developing countries, they're really between a rock and a hard place. They are already feeling the impact of our climate change from our development. And then, if we're going to keep CO2 emissions low, they're going to have to change their economy more, right, to do that. They are the countries that have to reduce their emissions. They're between a rock and a hard place here. How, do, how does this happen? How can we do this? My, you know, my view, and I think, you know, you know, here I'm not talking from the IPCC perspective because we're not allowed to say things like that, but I think developed countries and universities like Cornell have the obligation to try to figure out what pathways would work, what technologies would work, test them, right? The developing countries do not have the resources to test things and see if they work, and then try to make those technologies available. But there's gonna have to be a huge transfer of money as well, honestly, right, to, to get there. So just remember that where the emission cuts have to occur, it, you know, it isn't just in rich countries, it, it is predominantly in developing countries where the emission cuts have to occur. Okay, we, I personally do not want to get in the way of developing countries developing and people coming out of poverty, people ending hunger. We just have to do it in a way that doesn't emit as much CO2 as the pathway we chose, right? Which is, of course, the cheap way. Any questions on those reminders about the, the system? And, and some of those might be the first time you saw those, but I'm happy to talk about those. Yeah. Are there ways to decrease the 25% that will be in the atmosphere in 10,000 years, or is that like a set? So the question is, is there a way to decrease the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere after we emit it? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that, but um, basically what you're talking about is carbon dioxide removal, basically. You're some, some way to get CO2 out of the atmosphere, which would naturally stay a really long time, try to get it uh, somewhere else where it would stay sequestered. And that is key to uh, any of the low climate targets really, right? Just because there's all this inertia in the system and you know we have the issues with the developing countries, we have the issues with the technologies aren't available yet. Okay, so that's what we'll have to do to reach the climate targets. I guess I was just yeah. asking more about like that 25% you're talking about. Is that like gonna stay in the atmosphere forever? Like what does that 25% mean? What does that 25% mean? Yeah, that's the natural system. That's our estimate of the natural system. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna talk about 
what it was like to be on the 1.5 report here. And the 1.5 report is really unique in several different ways, all right? So there's an IPCC report called the, the 1.5 report, but the actual language is much longer than, than that. The, so we abbreviated it 1.5 when we talk about it. Um, and the full language is, it's an IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels and related global greenhouse gas emission pathways and in the context of strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change, okay? That all sounds like what IPCC does every day, okay? That sounds very reasonable. Sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty here, yeah. okay? is really broadened from what normally the IPCC thinks about and really put at the crux of the, this whole report, this problem of its development, versus climate change, okay? You know, here in the US, we think of it as business versus the environment. And, and that could very well be true, but on the global scene, it's really development versus climate change is, is what a lot of we're, what we're talking about here, okay? Um, and so this was a deliberate effort um, to, to expand this report. Um, so this is much, much broader than the previous reports the IPCC has written. Um, and it's the first report to actually go across what's called three different working groups um, of, the, of the IPCC. Normally we have um, the three working groups are physical science of climate change, people like me. Then we have impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. So who, who and which ecosystems are gonna feel the impacts. And then the third one is mitigation. And so this is the first report where all three of those work together on a report. The second part is where this report comes out of. And so it actually comes out of the Paris uh, COP, Conference of the Parties. So the Conference of the Parties is an annual meeting of all the signatories of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, okay? And out of that Framework Convention on Climate Change, I think in 1990, 92, somewhere there, you know, two things happened is they established the Conference of the Parties, the COP meeting every year, and then the IPCC was born. So we're the scientists who are supposed to help advise the um, policymakers on the uh, government side. And um, at the Paris Agreement, you might remember that this is the agreement which uh, it got a lot of publicity. It's 2015. The countries agreed that anything above two degrees warming is dangerous. Okay, they're gonna try to avoid it. And secondly, they agreed to voluntary emission cuts that in absolutely no way would ever keep the world below two degrees. It's actually in the agreement, it says, we know that this is completely insufficient, what we're promising to do. And so it was a change where before they were trying to get mandatory cuts and they just gave up on that and it's, it's all voluntary cuts is what uh, the, the Paris Agreement went for. So apparently at this COP, the um, countries that will cease to exist if there's two degrees of warming, okay? Small island developing states. With two degrees of warming, there's gonna be enough sea level rise in a few hundred years that some countries would cease to exist. Some small island developing states would cease to exist, okay? And so it's not that many people who live on these islands, but of course it is very important for them and for the cultural value that they bring. And they stood up and said, two degrees is not enough. You guys, we gotta do better. And we're tired of the scientists telling us that, that two degrees is the lowest we can reach. We want you to tell us what we would have to do to reach 1.5, okay? And so, uh, so that's where this report comes out of. It's, it's a passionate appeal from the small island developing states that we go for a more aggressive goal than the two degree, which I already told you the two degree requires radical restructuring in the economy, including everyone turning into a vegan. But anyway, it, you know, this is what we were asked to do for this report. So that's very different the, um, that it was asked for from the governments. The only report ever asked for it from the governments. Any questions? All right, um, and so this whole report came out of it. This is the front cover. They had a um, artist go, and this is actually the temperature record and the stabilization at 1.5. IPCC is jointly organized by the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization. And the idea is the scientists write the report and the governments approve uh, 
what's called a certain part of the report called the summary for policymakers. They approve it line by line. So I'll just tell you a little bit about that process from my perspective as one of the scientists on it. Um, so there were 91 of us from 40 different countries. Uh, as you could probably guess, there was an overrepresentation of people from uh, North America and Europe on this, but there was a lot of effort to bring in a more diverse group of people. So there was more diverse than previous IPCC reports, more women on there, more people uh, from different countries. They don't, they don't care about how we would uh, talk about it with historically marginalized individuals. They just talk about more countries, more people from the global South, for example. Um, because of how broad it was, as well as how quick we had to write it, and in, in general, we have a lot of contributing authors. Um, there was 133 contributing authors, 91 authors. Um, we, we really were supposed to only look at impacts from 1.5 versus 2, because 2 had been assessed before, and how to get below 1.5, uh, how, how to stay below 1.5. So um, in the uh, that, that means that we, we had about 6,000 studies that we were really, that came out that we were supposed to focus on. We had uh, 1,100 reviewers and 42,000 comments that we had to deal with in terms of improving the uh, reports. So um, for IPCC reports, we have to have line by line uh, discussion of how we're going to modify the report to be consistent with the reviews. So to be honest, a lot of what the authors have to do is try to make sure they're consistently dealing with the reviewer comments and making modifications consistently across the whole report. Um, so we would have these lead author meetings and that's what we'd be like, okay, we have to change this. How are you gonna change yours? Oh, you're gonna change yours that way? No, you know, we, we have to talk about how to make the report consistent. So we have just, you know, one interpretation of the scientists, the science. So in these reports, um, uh, you know, there's a scoping meeting, there's an approval of the outline by the government's nomination of authors, that's where I entered, selection of authors, um, then, then it's reviewed several times, and then there's the approval and acceptance of the report. So the summary, the, the summary for policymakers is, is really the most important part of the document. So the rest of the document, you know, might be <laughs> this thick. And the summary for policymakers was, I, th I think, like 13 pages uh, in Word document. I don't remember how long it was once it was modified and printed. Um, and that is the part that the governments have to approve line by line. So the governments agree that the summary for policymakers represents the science assessed in the report correctly. And it has to be approved by consensus. All the governments have to agree. And it was supposed to be done, um, that's almost five, five years ago, almost. Um, Monday through Friday is supposed to be done Friday, 7 p.m. Um, and we started out with like a 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. session and a 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. session. And so this is an official UN event. That means that everything has to be translated simultaneously into five languages. So we were actually somewhat limited by the translators, the number of translators. They, added uh, an evening session because normally these have trouble getting done. Um, and so they brought in a whole nother group of translators so that we could do everything um, in, in all the different languages. Then on Thursday, they added another night session, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. And Friday went all night straight through to being approved on Saturday at 3 p.m. Um, so, this is just an example of how we did it. I, I should have taken a picture of what the rest of the hall looked like because it was at least a thousand people in there. You know, all the delegations from all the different countries uh, were in the room. Then you have the authors up front. And uh, the, right here, what we have is um, Valerie um, and uh, Jim, Jim Skyge, as she and uh, oh, Paul, Paul Mo is not here, so she's French, and she's the co-chair was with a Chinese individual, and um, Jim is one of the other uh, co-chairs of a different group. So there's there's six co-chairs, and two of them were the leads on this report. Then here I am talking about our section of the report and what it um, what it was supposed to say. We we tried to describe it in English so that at least the uh, government delegates knew what we were trying to say. Um, to try to smooth things out and, and hear, you know, Morgan is going to speak right after me. Um, and so the authors come up and they describe the bullet points that we we're trying to make, then we read it. 
And then the co-chairs open the discussion and then you have these interruptions, um, interventions from the government. Um, I don't like the order you put that, you should use this order. I don't think that that follows the science on this point or this point. So basically, and then they, they send it back to huddle. So this is one of the misunderstandings that the climate skeptics often talk about is that these things aren't debated. This is all behind closed doors, but the governments, especially governments with uh, economic interest have read every paper that we cite and every paper we didn't cite and will try to argue their point as much as possible. So there is a lot of argument. At this point, all the governments can argue about is what papers there are, how strong those papers are, and whether it's in the approved um, uh, um, outline, that's all. So in the approved outline, for example, uh, human rights are always rejected out of the approved outline because some countries do not want human rights mentioned. You might not realize this, but the United States is one of those countries because the death penalty violates human rights, okay? So we do not have a great human rights record from that perspective, okay? But there's other countries who will also nuke human rights whenever they see it. In our chapter, they accidentally left something in so that we could, they left equity in, you know, so then we tried to expand that as much as possible and talk about all the issues about um, uh, equity and human rights that we could um, without mentioning human rights because that would, they would nuke that right away. Um, so then, then the authors have the final say, but the governments uh, can uh, not agree or disagree with approving a session. So the IPCC is trying to make this a uh, less um, hidden process. So they actually you know, had Twitter feeds and here we are trying to work in a little huddle to, to figure out how to respond to some of the um, government issues on a particular question. So then you know, after two nights basically of no sleep, here is a picture of all the authors after it's been approved. And it almost didn't get approved. It's really nice that it got approved. We had put a lot of work in to it. So that's what we come up with is, is um, then this report trying to look at this question of how do you reach 1.5 as well as does it matter if you reach 1.5 or is two uh, basically the same? Um, let's see, there were a bunch of other reports, but let me just talk a little bit about um, what was in the report. Um, you know, number one, at that time, 2018, we had one degree of warming from anthropogenic is what the attribution was. And so to stay under 1.5, we argue was um, actually, um, it, past emissions alone do not commit the world to 1.5, that, that in 2018, we could uh, keep, keep emissions below 1.5, or keep the emissions low enough to stay below 1.5. Um, but you know, at the current rate, we would reach 1.5 between 2030 and 2052. So at about 2040, is if you look at the, the slide. And we're already seeing consequences. We're already seeing the impacts. So for example, here's a slide showing you know, 2100, 2017, 1960. Here's the anthropogenic uh, uh, um, increase in temperatures. Right, and there's here's the monthly averages around that. You just extend this and about 2040, you're at 1.5. So somehow what we're trying to do is stop that increase, right? And turn things around. And um, so if you just take a look at what that means for emissions here, over here is kind of a stylized um, look at emissions. So here are, uh, CO2 emissions per year from, uh, I guess, 1970 out to 2030. Here's the increase that we've been seeing. We have to stop increasing and radically decrease the CO2 in order to keep below 1.5. This is what we have to do. That makes the cumulative CO2 emissions uh, stabilize at that point because we're no longer emitting. And um, then, you, you know, non-CO2 uh, emissions matter a, a little bit for this. And we have to keep in mind those, um, but it's really the CO2 emissions that are the most important and the hardest to, to cut. So um, one of the things that we also emphasize in this report, and you, you can see this also in the more recent report that came out in 2020, 2021, is really this emphasis on saying, 
you know, we argued every half a degree matters. And, and you can see that also in the, more, the latest reports as well. 1.5 versus two, you know, less extreme weather, less sea level rise. You can see a half a degree. It is statistically significant, okay? And that's one of the things we really wanted people to understand. Every half a degree matters. Try to stay as low as possible. Um, so what do we have to do to, to reach the low, to keep the low uh, climate targets viable? Um, so from this report, it says to limit warming to 1.5, CO2 emissions have to fall by 45% by 2030. And uh, the, you know, if, we, if we we're only going for two, they have to go down by 20% instead. And we have to reach net zero by 2050 to reach the um, low climate targets. And it's at 2075 by, for the two degrees. Reducing non-CO2 emissions has a, a right away a direct impact. So here we're, we're really talking about methane, um, that if you uh, cut methane today, you have me less methane in the atmosphere, it doesn't accumulate the way CO2 does, but right away you're helping uh, people because methane emissions lead to ozone, which is an air pollutant. And you can save millions of people's lives right away if you cut air pollution. So um, this is one of the things we tried to emphasize in the report is co-benefits of climate policy in terms of the impacts on people. Limiting warming to 1.5 would require changes at an unprecedented scale. So sometimes people talk about the revolution where everybody got a cell phone, which most of you probably don't remember, um, but that happened you know, within five to 10 years, everyone had a cell phone. So we need that kind of transition across all sorts of sectors, all right? We need um, deep emission cuts in all sectors, a whole range of technologies and policies, huge behavior changes as well, and increased investment in low carbon options. So we have this great progress in terms of wind and solar in the power sector. So that progress has to be mirrored in other areas, okay? We gotta figure out how to do metal smelting, really low carbon, build concrete, really low carbon. Those kind of things have to be done as well. Try to revolutionize our agriculture to make it so that um, it doesn't emit as much CO2 or other greenhouse gases. All right. So um, let's talk about some of these representative uh, pathways here. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use this other one as a demo instead here. Okay. So these are called illustrative model pathways. So um, this, this number one version here is a scenario where you know, emissions, um, uh, you know, here's the past emissions, and then all of a sudden CO2 emissions just drop off radically. Here. And um, and stay down, and the the gray is fossil fuel and industry, and the the brown here is agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. Okay, and um, it, is, it stops being a positive for CO two and turns into a negative. So you're sucking down CO two. Um, to be this is more natural solutions if you've heard that. Okay, so how in the world do we do do this? Well, it, you know, it has this nice description here, but the really operative word that you have to look at, it's a scenario in which social business and technological innovations result in lower energy demand. So what, what they had to do to keep temperatures below 1.5 is just in their little cute little called integrated assessment models, they just went in and cut energy demand by 50%. Just cut it by 50%. That's the only way to keep temperatures below 1.5 is to make an arbitrary, <laughs> huge cut in energy demand, okay? So you have to do everything um, uh, possible kind of here to keep temperatures below 1.5. So probably not very realistic, right? What was the cut in energy under COVID, right? Which was a radical restructuring of the economy. It was something like 20% temporarily, okay? So we have to have more disruption to our economy then under COVID in order to do this. All right, so remove that 50% cut in energy here and you, you get this case here. 
And so it takes a while to turn the fossil fuel emissions around because you continue to have development in developing countries and you continue to emit um, as you're trying to switch over in the developed countries as quickly as possible. Um, and you can see, you know, all that gray up there. Well, cumulative emissions is what matters for reaching the, code, the target. So that CO2 has to come out of the atmosphere somehow. And that's what this yellow part is here. And so, um, yeah, I cut off the scale here. It should be right there. But this is carbon dioxide removal. And the method that was chosen in the model, so the cheapest method, um, and the only one that's potentially technologically viable, is bioenergy carbon capture sequestration, BEX. Bioenergy, so you grow plants or trees that take the CO2 out of the atmosphere and they form organic material. That's the bio part. You take that, you burn it, so you get bioenergy from that. And you take all the CO2 that comes out of that and you concentrate it and you stick it into the ground somewhere. And that's the carbon capture and sequestration. Okay. Um, so this is actually a huge amount of infrastructure. You can take a look at this that, you know, you got 40 billion tons of CO2 being emitted there right now. So you just think about all the infrastructure we have today to help us emit all the fossil fuels, you know, the gas stations, power plants, all those things. We have to have that same infrastructure that's sucking down CO2. It's a huge amount of infrastructure. And the other thing is how much land that you need to do that. And it's, it's a large fraction of the land that we currently have, for example, in the, in the Midwest, making corn or something like that. You'd have to convert that all to some kind of biofuel that actually works, right? Corn ethanol doesn't work. You have to convert it to something that actually works. The amount of land that's required for this, um, we report in our, in our report, and then there, there came a report right after us called the um, the land report. So it was working on land degradation and food security issues and biodiversity issues. That report says, you can't do this. This is not sustainable. Don't do this, <laughs> okay? So our report says this is what you have to do to keep it under 1.5. And their report says, don't do it. There's no way you can do that without causing food security issues, biodiversity issues, all sorts of environmental problems, okay? So this is an extremely hard target to meet. Um, let's see. So what happened under COVID? Um, there were a bunch of, uh, of papers. I don't wanna go into too much detail here, but the basic point is COVID probably is not gonna do that much to our CO2 uh, emissions here. It's not a big hit compared to some of the things. The dissolution of the Soviet Union what was a, a relatively big hit, um, but this probably isn't gonna be, and the short-term emissions were about 20% in there, it's a, and it's just short-term, so it's not gonna cause a big problem or a big change in our trajectory, it's just a blip. Okay, so what does this mean? What, what, what can we do here at, in New York? Um, and you know we have one of the most aggressive um, uh, um, carbon um, uh, um, climate laws already here in New York. What does it mean? So uh, if we think at the national level, the US and the UK governments have themselves a goal of uh, reaching carbon neutrality in the energy and power sector by 2050, if you take a look at what they're, they're claiming. This is, this is probably very doable. And, as long as we figure out the intermittency problem, right? I mean, right now, wind and solar are actually cheaper than burning gas in a lot of places and definitely cheaper than coal. Um, it, this is probably consistent with the three degrees C, okay? And it, you know, this it might even happen without any climate policies, but um, it certainly helps to have climate policies. But reaching carbon neutrality at the global level it just by from a justice perspective, a climate justice perspective, if the whole globe is supposed to be there at 2050, don't you think the developed countries have to like start first, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. So if the US and the UK are only trying to reach carbon neutrality just in the power sector, the easy sector, by 2050, it's not nearly enough, right? It's, 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 we have to be much more aggressive. 
I mean, the rich countries have to lead. I think that's obvious. We're the ones with the resources. We're the ones with the old fossil fuel infrastructure that we can use as backup as we try to figure out how to switch to wind and solar. And, and the rich countries have caused the problem, right? They have the obligation. So in my mind, this is not sufficient what the US and the UK are, are arguing that they're gonna do and is consistent with 1.5. I can't, I don't understand why they're saying it's consistent with 1.5. I mean, anybody who thinks about the political situation is gonna say, obviously China and India are not gonna <laughs> try to reach um, carbon neutrality by 2050, if we are, right? They're gonna look at their cumulative CO2 emissions. Why wouldn't they, right? It, anyway, just crazy what people are saying. Now, um, the, there, there have been some climate bills put forward. Let's see, I think I have a slide that has more. Because we last year we actually passed oh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and that's gonna um, get us a little bit better situation. but it's still not aggressive enough to, to, you know, it'll get us to three probably, but it's not aggressive enough. And here in New York state, it is kind of the same thing that the goals are fairly aggressive for the power sector, but they're only focusing on the power sector and they're not gonna get us to negative emissions at all. And we could argue if we really wanna go to negative emissions, to be honest, using current technologies, cause they'd be so damaging if we use BACs. Um, so it's actually being on this report made me um, come back to Cornell and really kind of cheerlead for more investment in more innovative carbon dioxide removal methods. I mean, it's not what I do for a living, but if we're going to reach anything below three degrees, we need a huge investment. We need a revolution in carbon dioxide removal techniques, just like we saw in, in renewable energy. Um, and so that, that's, that's the only way to stay below three degrees. So to summarize, so in 2017, 2018, one degree of warming was here already. We're probably above that now. It's continued to warm. Um, and it's not impossible theoretically to stay under 1.5, but it's, I hope I convinced you it's gonna be hard if not impossible. We already need to start adaptation. I mean, that, that is just so important and people are behind on adaptation. There was kind of this feeling in the climate community that we should only talk about mitigation for many, many years. Finally, people are talking about adaptation because we have to. And, you know, we need to be thinking about things like carbon dioxide removal also in terms of um, not replacing mitigation, not replacing switching off of um, CO2 emitting technologies, but in addition to them, just because that's what we have to do to keep temperatures low. It's really, really ambitious to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees C. It's going to take a lot more work than we're doing right now. We have to move to sustainable energy now, much faster than we're doing today. We need huge amounts of behavior change. Everybody's got to use less energy, use um, agriculture much more efficiently, um, uh, need to move to sustainable agriculture, need to develop carbon dioxide removal technologies. The ones, like I said, that we have back says too many negative feedbacks. And I think developed countries have to lead on this issue. I think that's a political reality. I also think it's a just reality. That's the only way to have a just society. The report identifies many potential trade-offs between climate policy and sustainable development, but really tries to focus on the synergies, okay? Because there's just so many ways that if you do this badly, you're gonna have bad impacts. So we, we have to try to make sure we don't impose expensive technologies onto developing countries. We can't block their development. They're just not gonna, they're not gonna do that. We need to try to figure out ways to have a high standard of living, higher standard of living with, that doesn't emit so much CO2. So um, the report really is trying to identify the potential synergies. All right, I think that's my end. Thank you. Yeah, I can take a couple questions too. Yeah. I was just wondering, in the report, is there a recommendation for governments into how much investment it would require for these goals or some type of guidance from a financial standpoint? So one thing about the IPCC is we're not allowed to be policy prescriptive. But one of the things that we can do is say, if you want to meet these goals, then you have to do this, okay? So if then statements are okay. Um, 
And uh, certainly climate finance is a super important issue in these reports. At the time we wrote it, there wasn't enough information about it, to be honest. But everybody knows you have to stop investing in finding more fossil fuels and start investing in other technologies. And you know, I would argue in the US, with, with some of the actions that have been taken since the Biden administration took over, we actually are investing um, more in these areas, but we need way more investment. But it's on the right track. Let's see, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion on, like, I feel like there's a lot of talk sometimes between, um, like, who's responsible for, like, helping climate change and mitigating things, like, how much of it is just government investment in big companies versus, like, the individual and, like, actions you're taking of, like, taking public transportation, the groceries that you buy, all, like, the, you know, environmental-minded things we can do. In your opinion, like, how much is it responsible for the person is important versus is it really just not as significant and it's more just the company's investment? So to me, everybody's got to do their part. Absolutely. And you can say the government needs to do their part. They need to set up the incentives so that companies do, do the right thing, right? Companies are there to make money, okay? You got to set up the system so that they will make the right choices. Um, then uh, individuals, it, it has to be behavior change. Any of these, you know, you have to do what you can, okay? I don't know about you, but I've done my carbon footprint and I'm a vegetarian and I walk to work and I, you know, try to make my house energy efficient. Okay. But before COVID, I flew a lot, right? I went to these IPCC meetings. Okay. That was my biggest carbon footprint. Okay. So I would argue that we all have to try to do what we can. Um, and we, you know, have to vote. We have to, you know, innovate you know, there's systemic changes that have to occur, but individual changes as well. That's my personal feeling. Yeah, right behind her. Um, one of the ambitions that it says, like the developed countries need to lead on innovations. What is being done in order to like motivate this? Because it's very difficult considering they have fewer resources and depend on more things to like, get money. How, how do you mean what is being done? What? So like, if you guys are like recommending that developed countries- oh, this is me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I took off the IPCC. This is me. Right? Okay. We, we can't. We can't say too many things. Yeah. The IPCC there. Anyway, that's the part of the, the report that we were unable to get through is the fact that there has to be international um, cooperation. It's, it's so obvious, but that part was the part that the governments didn't want us to say. Yeah. There have been since then, though, um, quite a few big funds set up. Okay. So, and I'm gonna remember, I think it's the climate fund um, should have 30 billion. Okay, and, and that's big, but it's not anywhere near big enough, but it should have 30 billion in it to try to help developing countries mitigate and adapt. And then there was just recently in the last COP, a loss and damages fund. Okay, so for example, you know, Pakistan was just nailed by all this flooding. Um, part of it you can attribute to climate change. They should have access to this fund, right? It, you know, if, if that's all, goes through. I, I don't know the science on that one. Right. Then they would have access to more resources. But the developed countries have not been filling those funds up. Okay. But you, you could start to think about that, but it has to be trillions of dollars, not billions of dollars. Let's see. How about over here? What would you recommend to the developing countries to want to lower their climate change? Like, what do you think they should have? So um, I'm not an expert at that. I also think developing countries no, no best, but, but um, and it's a really hard trade-off for, for them because they don't have the energy that, like we've got grandfathered in all these old fossil fuel plants. So we can put up all this wind and solar or not, but we could put it all up. And then if, you know, for a week, there's no wind and no sun, we can throw on those fossil fuel plants. I mean, the developing countries are in the position where some of them don't have the energy now so what do they do? Okay, so it, it has to be their choices, but I do think that we have could play a role in trying to debug the problems before they, they come up. That, that's my view. Yeah. What types of like, sustainable agriculture methods are currently being like, I mean, like the hot topics for discussion within these reports? So the, the question is about what sustainable agriculture methods. I mean, there's always no-till, it, it always comes up. Um, and uh, there's a whole section in the latest one on agroforestry that, you know, we had a coordinating lead author um, from Cornell, who's a, an expert on agroforestry. Rachel Besner Kerr, right, was on there. So they're, they're really, they're thinking about everything, okay? And 
one of the things about the agriculture side of the problem is we actually probably know what we should do a little bit more on, on that side. The problem is convincing the 1 billion people who manage the land to change what they're doing. And, and, and you got to be sure, I mean, farmers are so much on the edge of, uh, of not producing, of, of being poor. You, it's a very hard um, situation and you have a lot of cultural values that you, you want to support and yet change people how they're doing something that is deeply cultural. It, it's a really, really hard problem, I'd argue. Um, not so much a technological problem, but actually a, um, a human problem trying to figure out how to move forward on the agriculture um, perspective, but we definitely have to do better. All right, so maybe uh, one, one more question. How about way in the back there? Yeah, thank you so much for your lecture today. It was really interesting. Um, I guess just a question that I have um, is you, have, you, you had that slide about um, underdeveloped uh, countries and, and kind of some of the CO2 that they bring out with kind of how they, you know, in a, in a cheap manner, they, they kind of bring out to the rest of the world. Um, so my, my question is, have there been any underdeveloped countries that have been able to modernize in a kind of um, a way that's, you know, not harmful to the environment or are there kind of maybe some even smaller examples that maybe not in, in the whole, but just by a part, they're able to kind of, you know, modernize in a somewhat green way. So, so the question is, is there promising examples of um, development pathways that aren't as awful as the one we took? Um, and definitely there's quite a few examples there. Um, it's not clear how much you can scale up some of them, but there, there are definitely examples of that. And that's in the 1.5 report. And I think also in the more recent report, some of these examples, they're trying to do more case studies and trying to connect people who have different ideas so that they can find kind of, um, you know, people in a situation similar to them to transfer knowledge, right? It, that's really, oh, okay, we did this and we were able to succeed um, in keeping our emissions low and yet raising our um, standard of living. So they're, they're trying to emphasize those more. It, it's a little harder once you try to scale up to the national level or, you know, really large scales. There's fewer examples at this point, but hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do better, right? Thank you.